Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Pot Scum. This is the podcast where we dive into the deepest, darkest, murkiest waters with a plethora of legendary guests. I am your host, your bastard of ceremonies, the number one scumbag himself, Rex Ruger. That's Rex with three X's. Don't get it twisted. I'm also known as the King of Sleaze, a.k.a. the Hair Metal High Priest, a.k.a. the man with the golden voice and the velvet tongue. But most importantly, a.k.a. Diamond David Lee Roth Jr. That's right. And the DNA testing is almost conclusive. Was just on the conference call with my attorneys, and we are almost at the finish line, folks. We will prove it once and for all. That I am the son of glam, the front man for the band. Got a million fans, just smoked a few grams. I'm your ice cream man, Mr. Wap Baba Loo Baba Wap Bang Bang Shazam. Hot damn. Woo! And I'm feeling good. And of course, this is the No Frills podcast. You don't get frills because you get to look at me and get plenty of thrills. Not to mention, I'm almost 50 years old and I don't know shit about technology. So you don't get glitzy little intro themes little animation bouncing across your screen, all these bells and whistles and hoopla. Fuck it. You get none of it. But you do get kick-ass guests, and you get to look at me. I am, of course, coming to you, as always, from the Pink Pussycat Lounge, a.k.a. the Den of Sin. And if you're taking a look at my hair and you're thinking, Rex, how do I look as gorgeous as you? <laughs> little product placement here. Get the product that does it all. Get your quaff in order. Let me give myself a look here. And of course, as I'm giving myself a look and trying to find my bad side, which doesn't seem to exist, I remind you that on top of bringing you this fantastic podcast and being the hardest working guy in show business, I am also fronting numerous glam slash sleaze metal bands up and down the eastern seaboard. My main focus, of course, right now, as you all know, is Love Sword my new band that I am still carefully combing the world for virtuoso players. So if that's you, hey, hit me up. I'd be more than happy to give you a shot. If you want a shot, that is. But right now, I'm going to invite my guest in here, and I'm very pumped up to have him, very excited. So uh, we about to get it on. yippee ki -yay, motherfuckers. So as we wait for him here, I will remind you that if you would like to be part of the band that gets to stare at the backside of the second greatest front man to ever do it, you know, hit me up in the comment section, send me an audition tape, however people do it nowadays. I mean, you know, I'm out here. I'm out here. They know they no hard time finding me. Now, if only, you know, Diamond Dave Sr. could find me. And realize that, hey, I have a son in upstate New York. Let's connect, Dave. Let's connect, Dad. Love you always. I don't want to get emotional on you guys and start getting all sappy. That's not the direction that I want the show to go in. So I guess we'll just get pumped up for our guest. I will give myself yet another look. Mm, 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 mm. The problem with looking is I never want to stop looking. But I must put the mirror down. Trying to get better about that. Talking with my therapist about my vanity, which apparently seems to be something I need to work on. So as I get my notes in order here for my good buddy that's coming on here. And I'm very happy to. Be having him on the show, gracing my Podscum audience with his uh, presence. Excuse me as I disappear from the screen for a minute here just to make sure that uh, he's raring to go, and he is. So let's get it on. Here we go, folks. Drum roll. Da, da, da. Mr. Fortman. <laughs> Hi there. What's Wait happening? a minute now. Right out of the gate, are you laughing at the hair already? It's so rad, dude. 
I love it. It is red. And I, are, are you able to tell when you look at me as a guy that's been around the music business for a while? I mean, it is, is it undeniable that I am obviously uh, related to this man? That's not you in the poster? Ah, you're getting on my good side already, Mr. Dave Fortman. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, for, uh, for my audience that out there who's been living under a rock that doesn't know, I, I think they would probably be most familiar with you from your work with uh, Ugly Kid Joe, a band that I absolutely have always loved. But you also do a lot of producing nowadays, right? You do a lot of behind the scenes stuff. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Now, 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 now in today's music business, with so many changes that have happened, that have been going on, obviously the whole landscape of the business has changed. Do you like being a behind the scenes guy more, or do you like, you still like performing? Uh, well, you know, it's a tough call, you know, performing. I love man. You know, I went out yeah. with ugly kid in 2017. Um, it was a, that's the first time I toured with them since we had been in, you know, from 96 or whatever. Right. But, and it was my 50th birthday and I had the time of my life. I mean, it went on for three years uh, all the way through the end of 2019. Right. And there's moments, man, I tell you, there's moments where it's a packed club or like in, you know, I think in Paris, we sold out a thousand seater and it's, a, it's all fans, you know, and especially what part of the tour was in Australia, right? Where we had, we hadn't toured there since 92 and that gave me the feeling it, I can't say it's really as big as the moment when, you know, Evanescence went huge. Right. You couldn't, you, every station had it on there, modern sure. rock, you know. Yeah. So both feel really good. But I have to say, man, the how huge my production was, especially that first year when it ever happened and Evanescence had taken over the world, literally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I remember I was sitting in Sausalito. And I was doing the, the first mud vein that I'd ever done, lost and found. And, yep. uh, and, the, and it, it was kind of buzzed. And I was outside and I shouldn't have been in a, in a car, but I was, it, it, was, it was only, you know, half a mile to the place I was staying. So I'm so yeah. kind of buzzed and sitting in this minivan that I rented. Yeah. So I decided to go park up on this hill and look out over the, and at, out of the blue on comes, it, uh, sorry, it came on, uh, bring me to life. And, you know, and I had a decent buzz. I'm sitting there, I'm looking out over Sausalito, I'm like, okay, this is real, man. This is yeah, badass. Pretty you know, cool. Man. Yeah. That that feeling I think was probably the best feeling of my life, you know. Yeah. Now next right, I mean, neck and neck or like back when Ugly Kid was uh in the prime, you know, we would play these these festivals, right? And you know, Wit is just magical with these things. Like he'll, he, you know, he and he would have, you know, eighty thousand people involved with this with a band that's not nearly as big as the headliners on the festival, right? But in the fe the feeling of that when the crowd's yelling or they're singing along with neighbor or whatever song it might be or cats right. or everything about you, yeah, there are two different things. But I think the the largeness of Evanescence in in uh, especially after Slipknot had come out number one and all these things is probably a a more internally huge feeling. Is at the festival we're really not that famous you know it's just right. it's really good at controlling an audience and we have a couple of songs they know sure yeah but having you know get, having a number one album around the world i think was much bigger yeah for me yeah overall. that's pretty mad that's pretty cool now that, now you've worked uh you know you just mentioned a couple names evanescence and slipknot and uh I, i've got on my list here crowbar super joint ritual soylent green um uh do you like exclusively working with heavier acts or is, you know is there a specific genre that you like working behind the scenes because a lot of those acts obviously uh especially speaking about super joint crowbar so Green, a lot of those are extreme metal bands do you like working with heavier bands well it was just really a matter of, of, of survival back then you know i'd gone home to louisiana right that the, the nola scene was really just essential it just kind of happened i you know i went home so i had kids suddenly i wanted to be around my mom to raise children so i left california yeah. um and the band had broken up and i couldn't afford california it was it's, it's still even in those days I way know. more expensive than it is was in louisiana so yeah so i went home and um just planned on running a local studio and so out of the blue you know, I'd known Pepper Keenan since I was probably 17 or 18. You know, we were yep. skate partners, man, back in the day. Yep. Long before he was ever in corrosion and all that stuff. We were just friends. And so 
the word got out that I was back home, and I think Pepper had told Jimmy Bauer, you know, man, Fort was home, uh, the king of the four track, they used to call me. Yeah. And uh, so then Jimmy Bauer came over with Clear Light, which is still one of my favorite records I've ever done, you know. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Clear Light, what an album. You Amazing. Know, it's, an it's great. Yeah. Uh, and then that got, that once I did that, that album on ADATS, man, you know, then Phil Anselmo became interested since he's also living across in the North Shore where I'm from. Yep. Uh, and so he came down uh, with the first super joint to try out two songs and uh, just was asking me how I got, how, how'd you make it sound like that? Like the clear light records, not only say it's not tape, man. I said, no, it's ADATS, man. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So he really liked the two songs. And then that once, once he wanted to do super joint, you know, I have all these other bands that, that wanted to come get the same kind of sound, you know, in that area. But at the time, at least in, in 1999 and 2000, they, you know, local studios, it was, there was one in New Orleans. And I think I took all the business out of that place, man, in, in one sweep when I'd gotten back. Because uh, everybody wanted to get good drum sounds and things like that. And I was really mm -hmm. good at that. Yep. So it really wasn't something I chose. You know, I just kind of fell into it. And, you know, layer by layer, it would all kind of matter how I got the next band. You know, uh, and then 12 Stones came through who were good. They ended up getting signed to, to wind up. And then I was got involved with Jay Barmgardner uh, to do the co-production on it. But. Um, the, the And it all leads to, to that one moment, really, to move forward in it. But no, it wasn't my choice to be in heavy rock. I mean, I could do a bunch of different styles if I tried, you know, for sure. Yeah. yeah. But it just seems like. As it started to build up, and it just kept parlaying into the next band and the next band and the next band that liked the stuff I'd done before. So, you know, it just kind of happened. It wasn't really a, a personal choice of mine. You right, know I mean? right, right. Was music yeah, always think, the choice for you, though? Because you come from, uh, I, I was reading online, uh, and, and hopefully I'm correcting this, but your parents were both uh, 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 teachers, correct? Yeah, their education, yeah. Yep. So, so uh, how early on did you realize that music was the direction you were going to go in? And uh, did you have supportive parents? No, we, uh, my, I have two older brothers. Yeah. Uh, and we, we all started, they started really young. And then, you know, my oldest brother taught me, I think last podcast, I probably quoted it too young, but somewhere around in Mississippi, man, we were in this house and he taught me how to read music because he was already playing drums in middle right. school or whatever. Right. So he got me and we were beating on pillows and pots and pans, making drum sets. And I think and I was make like, noise. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm at the, at the, at the oldest, I think I was probably eight or seven years old at that time. And so, you know, and that went, that never stopped. I mean, we were, you know, my dad played trumpet, his dad played trumpet. My mom played some piano, but uh, th I never really had a, a ch like a decision moment you know it's the only thing i've ever really done i've, I've been playing music since i was a small child right that's so, right and then it kept it kept changing instruments and i get in middle school and we had moved to louisiana um and and even in elementary i'm still playing stuff at home and doing all this stuff so i get into middle school in the fifth fifth grade and was on snare drum in the band then i show up you know later in that year with a trumpet in my hand you know, and the teacher's like, well, I'm not sure what you're doing here. You know, I said, I'm going to play trumpet today. I'm going to play some changing instruments. And then I became first chair trumpet. And then I went to junior high and then had the most glorious teacher of all time, Leon Sanders, man. This was a very soulful uh, black dude, man, from Grambling State University who taught me everything about how yeah. to be competitive and how to. So I became drum major, first chair trumpet. And he had already had both my brothers come through the school yeah uh, william pitcher was the name of the school so yeah that it the, i mean i'd never made a conscious decision to go to music it just was always in my life and it, there's well i know from talking to other musicians on here that obviously sometimes you know you get parents who are very uh you know very very leery about you know encouraging their kids to pursue careers in the arts you know just because it can oh, yeah. be their famine or they think that they're going to fall into bad habits or you know it, it's not really a you know a sustainable career or lifestyle choice you know so oh, yeah. i wasn't sure if you had the support of your parents or not or if they were you know prodding you to you know why don't you become a teacher yeah. why don't you become a doctor why don't you you know no you know i, re I remember vividly my mom saying 
you know, when I was ready to pack the car and go to California and, you know, they, they knew I was up to something good. I'd had every, every award I've ever tried to grab. I won throughout yeah. history of my life in it as a kid, you know, and my dad is, is a college professor, you know, even told me, said, look, you know, some of my best students are in their thirties, you know, so don't worry about it, man. Yeah. You know, like go do what you got to do. Yeah. Doing music. Uh, and you know, and, and on the opposite side of that, the band I was in Louisiana that uh, got to a peak in Louisiana, the EMI records came and saw us didn't really like the band. They like me, but so we, and I said, fuck that. We're getting in the car. We're going to California. So we all went, yeah. but there, you know, you know, at least the, the bass player's parents or his dad literally told him, man, don't do it. Don't follow Dave, man. He's going to fail. Yeah. You know? yeah. You need to just structure your life and, and focus on college. And yeah. of course he did that in California. He, he came out on top. He's a, a, a fabulous man. You know, he's got a great career. Yep. But, but back then, you know, and that made me really angry. And I was just like, well, fuck you. You know, I'm, I'll yeah, show you. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, it happened again in in my production career. As I, the band had, had given, we quit, failed to whatever we want to call it. And I go back to Louisiana and I'm literally just working in a local little studio trying to make, you know, zilch money, make almost anything. losing everything. Right. All the time. And then so that then my studio partner's father takes the next role. It gets me really pissed off, you know, and he comes in one time. So he's viewing me as a bottom feeder. And he even said it, you know, like he said, Yeah, you know, it seems like in this kind of career, he's looking at the studio that his son had helped build for me to come work. Right, right. And make zero money at at the time. Uh and he said, you know, it's in this, you know, the music industry is a lot like you know they say it's all the real successful people and then there's really nothing in the middle just the bottom feeders down below so he's basically right. calling me a fucking loser right right and uh <laughs> and that really got under my fucking skin bad and yeah. i don't think i ever i don't know if i ever even told my partner at the time that that had really upset me but nevertheless you know on the guy's deathbed uh he died like shortly after Evanescence had hit big, but it, but my partner was able to go tell him, look, my dad, like dad, Dave, just fucking, you know, knocked out of the fucking ballpark. Right, like, right, right, right. Did you use that as motivation at all? Did that motivate you? Like when he said, you know, well, 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 uh, yeah. did, did it kind of spark something inside of you though? He, uh, you know, him referring to you as not, like not successful or a bottom feeder, as you put it? Of course, both times yeah. in different decades. First one being the bass player's dad, and now it's my studio partner's dad, you know, and I, right. I I don't, I don't take well to that kind of shit, man. Sure, sure, sure. No, but yeah, no. that becomes that becomes the the driving force of it. But sure, you know, now, not, now, not the, now I'm looking at some of these, uh, you know, some of your, uh, you know, uh, uh, American Head Charge, as you mentioned, Evanescence, Mud Vein, uh, God Smack. There's a whole list of them. Are there yeah. any? Um, you know, without putting you on the spot, are there any albums that you were behind the scenes working on that you really? That, that you would that you would point at and say there's an example of my finest work uh not really i mean they're all you know <clears throat> they're all battles and they all take a lot of ups and downs and, and mountains to climb and it's it, you know um no i wouldn't say i think they're so different from each other really right and each process is so different you know certainly you could look at you know the most important things probably historically i mean that's a very easy one there i mean jesus christ it's slipknot for sure right sure yeah. absolutely they're, yeah they're, they've they're done pretty well for themselves dave they've done pretty well for themselves yeah. <laughs> so, it, they are i believe going to be vastly more important in the future than the history of evanescence i mean evanescence already lost all the like whatever giant glory they had on pop radio so that's right. Right. No longer a thing. They are, you know, Evanescence, Evanescence is now just a sort of a metal band. Why is um, that your opinion of Slipknot, though? Obviously, a lot of people probably look at a band like Slipknot who don't understand the music industry and probably think uh, uh, a bunch of guys, masks, costumes, kind of oh, theatrical, man. kind of corny, kind of stupid, what some people might say. But why do you think they'll be they'll make such an indelible mark and will continue to make such an indelible mark? Well, what it's just not that. Show? It's simple numbers don't lie, man. They're they're without a doubt the second largest metal band in the world under Metallica, and it's yeah. just their their level of success 
uh, and they haven't slowed down. I mean, you, you can just go on YouTube and look up any concert. I mean, these guys are filling in 30,000 seats. They are. In every, yeah. every, every shed. And they go to Europe and do the same thing. I mean, their, their tours are absolutely massive. Yeah. Their fan base is gigantic. They're number two Huge. behind Metallica. Yeah. Um, yeah. Without a doubt. And they're, they're not slowing down. There's another album coming and they just had one. And like they're, they are on the, the path to take over and be the number one metal band absolutely in the world. i would agree with that i would agree with that assessment now now uh speaking of bands though that don't uh, you, you know who might be kind of you know uh you know poo pooed and not taken as seriously now when i'm looking yeah. at the at the ugly kid joe stuff that you were a part of uh america's least wanted menace to sobriety motel california obviously you guys approached your music um uh you know uh with kind of a lot of tongue-in-cheek humor um do you think that that it all tarnished the legacy of how ugly kid joe is looked at as far as being taken seriously a lot like slipknot i mean the, you know the songs the music is great you guys were obviously very self-deprecating and able to have a good time and even point the stick at yourself sometimes and obviously yeah. have a lot of fun and spoof on a lot of stuff but do you think it, it all takes away from the fact that ugly kid joe is a fucking great band though uh I mean, that's a really, I mean, that's a loaded question with a lot of answers. I mean, really, you know, <laughs> know. I mean, you, know you also have to look at the time right. that, we, that we, what the, you know, what was the environment when we came out? I mean, Jesus, we were like the literal pimple on grunge at the time, you know, that we were coming around. Yeah. We may have been the last surviving piece of real metal uh, down to the wire. I mean, like, you know, because even after we'd come out we were running along with grunge in, in 92 or whatever then you have another wave that came in and with green day and yep. then the, and the punk scene that came in and so i you know it, when, it, in in retrospect when i look back i mean I, I find it to be fascinating that we had even a career at all during those times you know and uh and that type of music, I mean, especially we're, we're still being played on the radio at the time when sure. you have, you know, Pearl Jam emerging and all these bands that hated us, man, you know. Well, do you think that you guys were a band that were, that were the, you know, that were important for that time, though, because that music was so, you know, s you know, somber and heavy and downtrodden. Yeah. And, and, you know, it was kind of almost like a cleansing of the 80s stuff that we knew where it was all very frivolous and about drinking and girls and, you know, party and stuff like that. And then it seemed to be like that, that, that stuff was kind of cleaned out and then along came grunge. But you guys were kind of towing that line, you know, between alternative, but still kind of keeping the party alive though was that a conscious decision that you guys made though like look we're, we're still gonna have some fun here there, no conscious decision just no just, all just, you guys, it, it, just the kind of humor that you guys yeah. have i mean no, no that is who who we are as people right and certainly no there was no i mean was, we were just doing you know what we do and I, and I think that reflected in the live shows you know I mean, there was a lot of times when and I, not to steer off and not answer the question but no no, there was no, 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 no but you know people you know the media and like everything about you was out against the grunge world and so you know I, and well to answer your question you know yeah i think it was it was pretty important to a lot of people that were you know obviously when grunge hit there's still a portion of, of the of the uh community of metal right that's still out there and so those oh, yeah. really were our fans. So right. you know, I think that we were probably the one of one of the last standing flags for metal at the time, which yes. was really important. Uh, but that became such a small sector of the industry, then it then it you know got run over, obviously. But the one thing that we always did have was where uh people would see us live and it would it would change their minds about us, you know, because we we're yeah. a great live band, we had a great lineup. You know, a lot of the songs that weren't heard on radio or or, or heavy and, and cool, you know, a, a, a lot of Klaus's stuff, man, towards the vein of neighbor and all that stuff. You know, he's got a right. bunch of those cool songs that we would right. play, panhandling and all these things. They're great live riffs, man. Sorry, I keep itching my arm. I got this fucking bum. I got this itchy thing on my arm. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Now, uh, um, uh, so when you guys um, uh, are, are out and doing your thing in the early 90s, um, 
uh, are you guys getting a lot of pushback at the time um, uh, you know, because of that humor and because of the way you approach music when it was kind of viewed as this like, oh, music's just taking a very serious turn now. You've got to be, you know, everything's got to be, you know, you know, very well, dark. And, and, you know, these are the bands that are making it right now. Did you guys ever, was there ever a temptation to change your formula at all? Uh, no, we just would write. But yeah, man, the blowback, I mean, starting from day one. Uh, on us was huge in, in america i mean all you know we were uh, grunge guys hated us man really yeah I, re I remember me and cordell had gone to a party we all of us went and saw uh the black crows in germany okay. and and then me and cordell were invited by polygram records to go to the after party yep and so polygram di didn't really know that how we were perceived in America. And so during the party, man, the polygram, I guess they went and said to Chris or or whatever that okay, hey, look at Joe's here, man. And the guy looked and said, uh, throw them the fuck out. They gotta go. And so the polygram guy came over, had to throw me and Cordell out of that after party. Really? Robinson didn't want us in there, yeah. Even Cordell had to get tossed out too, huh? Both of us had to go, yeah. Or maybe might have been three of us in there, but I know me and Crockett definitely were there. I was there for sure. And so, you yeah. know, and also, you know, whatever. That's just what the way it was back then. And and oddly enough, uh, later in the future, nowadays, it, that perception somehow that whole thing's dead now. And just it doesn't yeah. really matter. I mean, it Thank seems God. like it's, you know, with the, the age of the internet and everyone having their own opinion now that that we've been able to come out with songs without having you know it seems like everybody's really nice about it now you know yeah so so when you uh, so uh how do you get linked up with the other guys at ugly kid joe I, how do you guys make that connection how do you meet them do you audition for them did you previously know them how does that whole, yeah. how does that whole collaboration um, come together i'll try to make it a short story uh you know i left like i told you the band that i had got to a certain peak yep uh, and then we went to California and started to play gigs out there, just the little stuff, FM station, these little, you know, coconut teaser and these places that were small clubs back then in, in Hollywood. Uh, and then I got involved with a guy that I knew from Louisiana, Tim Gruss, uh, was already out there. And so he asked me to come join in for a, a practice session because they had kicked out the guitar player in his band. It was called Sugar Tooth. Right. She died at the time. That's what it was called. But uh, it became Sugar Tooth, who got signed to Geffen. Okay. Well, so I go out there, and it was me and Joey Castillo from Queens of Stone Age, yep. the drummer. Yep. We're the few new guys. We're just coming in. And so we decided that when we played with each other, we wanted to, to go play Hollywood together because we really wow, – he was the best drummer I'd ever played with at the time. And I'm like, holy shit. And he was like, man, let's, let's go. He's like, he didn't really like the band. But he asked me if I joined the band with him so we could go play together, at least to go out and be seen by people. Right. So that turned into a major deal. We started to to really bombard Hollywood with gigs. And we got a lawyer, Dennis Ryder, who at the time was the, uh, also the manager uh, of Ugly Kid Joe. Okay. And they were just at the time, hadn't even done the first EP. Uh, they were, they'd just gotten a record deal with Mercury Records. And so I, there, so Dennis had this dinner one night, you know, like a year, you know, maybe a half before I ever joined Ugly Joe. And I met Witt and Klaus at that dinner. I went out and party with them all night. So we became really good friends. And I would drive up to Isla Vista every weekend. Literally, I'd get off band practice and go hang out with, with Klaus, you know. Yeah. So we, we'd play songs together all the time. We'd be jamming out just as friends, just as people. And then it started to get to, to a boiling point of, uh, Sugar Tooth now had a, a half million dollar record de deal on the table with Geffen. Right. And then, you know, me and Witt had become extremely close, like brothers, man, you know, me and Klaus as well. And so Witt really, you know, they had, they had all the demos of, of Sugar Tooth and everything. And Witt's like, man, I want that guitar style in the band. So then it, that process started to become a reality. And then they, you know, I had a choice to make here, you know, to take a gamble on Sugar Tooth uh to come out and, and be successful or just go with Witt and klaus they want me in the band there and they're already becoming famous you know they were their video was already out they were well into going platinum or somewhere around there you know when they first asked me that i think they were just selling like thirty thousand records and the video hit and then they were heading into being platinum 
Yeah, yeah. And plus, I was way better friends at the moment that with those two dudes than anyone in my own band. You know, I never right, even, we right. the band. I mean, our band didn't really like go out and hang out together. So it was a good jump for me. I just jumped out of the one record deal, and I realized, you know, like because we had hired a singer, you know, in Sugar Tooth. And I thought, well, I'm going to wreck this whole record deal if I jump out. Because at the time, um, Todd, the A&R guy, really liked me a lot. You know, I'm the main guitar lead guy. And then I realized, holy shit, Mark Hutner, who I was a fan of in Hollywood, we hired him to be the singer. And I'm like, wait, he's great on the guitar. He's as good. He's almost as good as me. Yeah. Almost as good as me. But he, <laughs> he easily played all the stuff that I played. And so th that was really a lot of it, you know, because. You know, I'm I'm pretty soft hearted, and I don't know if I'd have jumped if it would have wrecked all those guys' lives and like ruined their record deal. So, the, yeah. so they were able to play without me with Mark playing guitar, and that was it was game over. So, but, uh, when I made that connection, then I'd made the jump to Ugly Kid Joe, and that's how I got there. It was through being friend, being a big friendship with them for mm -hmm. over a year and a half. Yeah, it wasn't like an aud audition or anything. No. Now, fast forward when you guys do uh, your cover of uh, Cats in the Cradle. Uh, is that like like how do you guys like like pick what song you're gonna do a uh, to do a, a cover of? Do you guys vote on it? Does someone suggest that song? Because obviously you don't see Harry Chapin getting covered by a lot of hard rock slash you know heavy metal bands. Yeah. Who makes that call? Well, great that cover, happened. By long... the way. Great, great version of that song. Yeah, I think that happened long before even the record deal. I think I, I don't. I think Wit might have been the man the man to make that decision. Or back then, the boy to make that decision because he was, yeah. he was pretty young. Yeah. Um, I think at least you know when I first met him. I mean, the first time that I ever saw Cordell, because Cordell joined the band, um, he was the last member before I joined to, to make the original the, or the the lineup for America's Least Wanted, basically. Right. Right. So I had gone to a party, man, in Isla Vista, and there's this new dude getting out of a truck or whatever pulling a bass out and i'm like hey what's up dude he's like hey i'm cordell you know so we met and i did that's the first time i'd ever seen him play a concert you know and this is way early on this is right pre-ep like they hadn't recorded the ep or any of that stuff yet this is just them hiring a new bass player right uh and that in in that moment man that night i remember just being blown away but not i mean mostly by just all of it you know i was like man they're really great i mean wit's fantastic Our yeah guys yes. goddamn rock yeah. Star. i see why they would sign this band why mercury would give them a record deal and then they played cast of the cradle and i was just like whoa that's really cool and yeah. so they had already had that decision made long before i think i mean i, I could be wrong about this i'm not 100 percent factually sure about that so I don't know. I've never really asked with that, but I'm pretty sure it was either Witt or Klaus had an idea to play that song, probably with yeah. uh and they had it going in there in the in the set list when they would play Isla Vista and, and play okay. games around uh, Santa Barbara. Now, as somebody who's working, uh, who uh, who uh, who has worked and continues to work in in on, on, on both sides. Uh, of the music business, both performing and behind the scenes. When you're getting X coming in to work with you, what is the general consensus now of X coming in? Are you seeing like more of a, 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 a of a difficulty uh, with bands as far as like the morale? You know, because obviously going out and getting commercial success really deflates a lot of bands nowadays and how to sell their music and everything. Are you sensing any kind of like, a, obviously there's been a huge shift in the music business, but is that reflected in the artists uh, who are coming into your studio to work with you as far as them venting or complaining or just, you know what I mean? Like where the music business is right now? Well, I, you know, I'm not running people through a studio by any means, you know, I'm right. I'm semi-retired, semi man. Like, like I just, you know, finished mixing the Godsmack record. Right. The new one that's coming, but I'm not, I'm just doing off one-offs here and there with people that I feel okay. like I work with, you know, but I, I have no answer for that question. I, I really wouldn't know. I, I don't think that I, I have no idea, really. I mean, because it is a tough time to be a musician right now, though, right? I mean, you would certainly agree yeah. on that. I mean, it's, I mean, technology has certainly lent itself uh, uh, to a lot of advantages in life, but it really seems to be really putting a big damper on, on, on the music business. Yeah. I, I think it's changed so much that there's, it's hard to define. 
really. We're, we're at a point where there's so many different uh, islands to be on, uh, and there's no real one measure of success anymore. I mean, you know, there's, you know, you got Polyphia, who's uh, last podcast I did, I, I was raving about them. I mean, those guys are, they're YouTube up, man. They got YouTube now. I mean, Jesus. Yeah. They can have all kinds of success. There's success happening underneath the surface that, right. The, the larger, if you, if you look at how the music industry was a long time ago, well, then the large, you know, the larger public, is going to see everything that the record company is going to put out and they either like right. it or not, or the radio likes it or people call in. Uh, and then if it, if it hits, it hits, if it doesn't, it goes away. But nowadays there are things that are boiling there, you know, making tons of revenue that we, me and you don't even see, man. Right. I mean, it's right. just a different world. I mean, my, the stuff, my son's playlist, you know, on Spotify is way out there. Right? I have yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But then I look at the plays and I'm like, Jesus, they got you know, 40 million spins on this. I know, game. I know, it's pretty oh, crazy. I know, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's, and none of that how in in those artists that the younger generation or, or generation is listening to, uh, a lot of it has zero to do with any kind of radio or any of that. It's just right. underground pockets that are happening. Right, right. And there's thousands of them, which is a different world, and it's really hard to compare anything to the old system in my opinion you know well well obviously my my audience would probably uh hunt me down and fucking kill me if i didn't ask and i would be remiss not to but is there any kind of future with ugly kid joe as far as like uh any new recorded music i know you mentioned that you were semi-retired and you do still go off from time to time and play live gigs with them but is ugly kid joe uh pretty much uh an active band or an inactive band at this point now well they're completely active we have a new album coming out okay great okay okay yeah, i'm assuming you might have seen the first three videos we just put out yes yep yeah so those are leading up to uh rad wings of destiny which is the new record i like yeah. it all right <laughs> i have no idea when the, what the drop date is but there's some special stuff on it and we did a cover of lola the kinks lola nice Nice. which is real i think is great and i think it's probably it, one of which uh, greatest vocal performances it's fantastic so i'm, I'm now, how do you guys it. approach how do you guys approach when a record comes out now that you guys are all like in different places in your life do you go out and just kind of do like flyaway dates or 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 like will you guys actually go out on like a tour i mean i'm, I'm obviously everyone's yeah. got like you know have have carved out a life families children grandchildren maybe even you know how do you guys approach uh going out to do do live shows nowadays uh well they're full on um my three years are enough for me i'm, I'm not looking to, to go tour you know i don't know maybe maybe i'll get a spark somewhere along the line here but yeah they're they're going full on they have stuff booked for november and it's most it's europe you know okay and at some point i'm assuming they, they may try to come tour the states but it's it they've been doing they just got off of a european tour so they're they're fully active as a band right now uh and it's different dudes obviously it's Witten klaus with there's gonna be other guys playing but they're 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 we're working i mean as a band not me in the tour side of it but they are doing all the normal shit you know right so we're have an album they're going to be touring and so, on so what's so your on. level of involvement then how, how much did you have to do with the actual album itself i mean are you featured on uh, all the songs are you on a few songs did you do any production on it now well we uh, mark dotson we brought back from america's okay. one we had a fabulous time with him great producer great friend uh and that was back in before covid so we did all that in 2019 uh and i wrote a bunch on it you know recorded the whole album you know right. Play guitar i wanted to be a musician for once and just jam and <laughs> beer. uh and then uh back in this last march or whatever this year march this year uh me you know wit had some more songs in him so he came down and we we added two songs that i produced and recorded and co-wrote and those went on the album as well so that's all it really is yeah so yeah i was 100 percent involved with it yeah as a musician and a band member now going forward now as somebody uh, um you know uh, who's in the industry are there bands right now are you one of those kind of guys like me i'm going to be 50 years old next year i tend to get st still stuck in a time warp where i lean on my old favorites and i'm trying to be better with my apple music to try to find 
you know, younger, newer rock bands that are kind of, you know, flying the flag and, and carrying the torch? Are there any newer bands that really get you excited or that have really have really piqued your interest or that you're kind of keeping an eye on? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Once again, I'll pump Polyphia right now, man. I mean, that's. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One of my favorite new things is Polyphia for sure. I think okay. Tim Henson is one of the, maybe the greatest guitar player, in my opinion, on the ever okay. lived on the planet Earth. When you put melody lines and hooks, because it's only guitar, it's not singing, it's all musical. Right, right, right. You know, I've typically never been into, except for Clearlight, you know, since you know, right. 2000. 2000 right. uh, not been that really, in, it not been uh, uh, into music, uh, what do you call it, instrumental music. But this band, I, I think, is phenomenal. And there's a there's a few different ones, you know. Things will come out here and there. But, I, you know, I am still the guy that will drink a six-pack and start listening to Skinner, you know. Exactly. Me too. That's yeah, me I, too. I, I go right back, you know. And I I love, you know, you know I'm a, I'm a scholar study of 70s music. I just think that's probably the greatest decade yeah. in history. In music, yeah. if you look at all the bands that were involved, I mean, they, there's just endless, you know. I've, I was on a, a chain email with my brother and his friends about what was the best decade in music. And if you start looking at some of the list of all the bands that happened between 70 and 80, it's just staggering, man. Amazing. I, yeah, it really yeah, is. And, and so then I start, you know, and as I get older, and he, literally it's every single year I seem to develop a better uh ability to understand what they did I man how they in you know that's what's more shocking you know it, someone once asked me i think it was wit i think me and wit were in the car one time says man so it must be hard for you to listen to music now man you know since you're a producer and all and, and, and the fact is now it's it's actually the greatest thing ever now i can understand what they did and how hard it was to do it right right you're so, hearing I mean, with different ears it's the same and i think i told them later that it's like an architect looking at a building and it just might look like a building to me and you right right, right yeah, sure this guy, this guy can see things that we can't see right infrastructure so, all that yeah yeah and so i'm seeing the th same things when i go back now and listen to like magic man heart right you know and I'm, I'm not only here in the production in how the hell they got it to sound like that with all right. the different frequencies but i'm also hearing the actual performances Right. When there was no computer changing anything, you know, they had to really sit there and actually perform these things and the drummers and all these things. And so, and then when, when they're great and when they're really great songs in, in one of them was stairway to heaven. Now, you know, I, it, people, everyone's taken that for granted for 30 years now, you know, it's just like, Oh, there's stairway to heaven again. But if you really go give it a real listen on headphones and it, like, just understand how the fuck, how much talent it takes to make that happen or for oh yeah solo for jimmy page to play that at the end of the i mean or freebird another one that's been taken for granted for forever it's just a staple that you hear but if you really go in there and look at it like it's a book of history and it just it, you start listening to the, in, the inter intricacies of it where you know i never noticed all the rhythm guitars behind the solo that alan collins is playing at the end right you develop a, uh, a different appreciation oh, I'm like, whoa and yeah. leon wilkinson the bass parts against the rhythm see now i know how to listen to all that stuff i didn't know how to do that before right and when i do that then i start getting this the start memorizing all these fantastic things that al cooper did with these guys man the producer and it just i mean every pass i'm like whoa fuck. i just did it last week i went through another pass of all the Skinner records that I love, you know, and I was like, damn it, man. I mean, th this is serious shit. <laughs> There's a reason it's lasted this long. Yeah. It's not just because it was on the radio. It's because it's fucking fantastic. Well, really I'd, I'd, like to get you, I'd like to get your take on, uh, you know, because it's very topical right now. As somebody again who's worked, you know, you know, on 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 the production side and the entertainment side, um, yeah. how you feel about. Uh, some of these artists, uh, particularly right now, the ones that are taking the big lashing are, uh, you know, Motley Crue on the big stadium tour. Uh, I know Kiss yeah. has been taking a big backlash, particularly Paul Stanley. How do you feel about these bands? And I and I just like to just pick your brain and get your opinion. I've asked it before on here. Um, where do you feel about these guys using backing vocals and, you know, these quote unquote little cheats to kind of enhance the sound? Um, do you like when bands do that? Or do you think that you ought to be getting the authentic, 
you know, real deal? Or can bands kind of get a pass when they've achieved that like legendary status? Yeah, I don't mind. You know, it, it's such a normal thing now. Uh, certainly, you know, Evanescence was one of the early ones to to do it. I mean, it's been, you know, I think it's been going on forever. I don't, yeah. we, I don't think maybe we haven't noticed. But anytime that a band can run a click track, you know, and have a count off, and, uh, you know, right. Especially with the invention of Pro Tools. I mean, then, right. you know, open world here. I mean, you have right. all kinds of shit going on. Well, and at the end of the day, you probably want right. the best sounding experience, though, too. And some of these guys, yeah, why not? You know, there's some yeah. of these guys that obviously who can, you can't replicate what you did 30, 40 years ago. And, you know, your body changes, you know, your abilities change. I mean, um, so uh, as, as far as bands coming in now and recording music, do you think there's an answer to the right or wrong format to release music? And, and what I mean by that is a lot of bands are saying, you know, with the attention span of the of the public being so short now, a lot of people are, are just ha hammering the public with, with singles, you know, keeping their name out there relevant. Some are still doing the old school long play. Some are doing EPs. Is, is there a right or wrong way right now, to, you know, to, to, to put music out in a certain format? No, there's definitely not a right and wrong way. <laughs> it's just no. It's, it's just whatever you're most so comfortable doing. People are just doing all sorts of stuff, man. And there is no one law anymore about how it's how it's done. You know, I, you know, it's crazy the different. Sometimes it's just singles, obviously. You know, right. And I'm not really some expert on this uh, conversation. Seriously, I I don't really know. But I've but there are people still doing the you know, like single comes out and then they bust out the whole album. Right. Or like right. Ugly Kid, we're dropping it one a month and then it leads up to, I think, one more or, right. or maybe we're dropping the record. I don't really know. But I, I, it could depend on how famous you are coming into your release. That's a good point. Okay. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. I, I And honestly, I definitely don't want to go too far into it because I don't really know. And it, it's right. The, in history, somebody looks back at this and says, "Well, yeah, you're a dumbass." Completely <laughs> talked <laughs> <laughs> out of my ass about. Hey, it. listen, I don't think anyone's going to say that about this conversation. I'm the one with the David Lee Roth wig on right now, so I, I think you'll escape <laughs> unscathed. But uh, so, I, so uh, I want to ask, uh, but you know, being as that you did have a big part uh, uh, in, in that uh, New Orleans uh, scene that we talked about at the top of the interview, um, and it's also very topical right now. Where do you since you've worked with some of these guys? Where do you stand on the big? Uh, pantera reunion coming up uh, uh are you for it against it do you like the guys that they got to uh, to fill the parts of course i'm for it yeah um yeah i mean i'm i mean i was sitting on philip's couch drunk as fuck one time um uh, way back 2000 i don't know three or four yeah and uh well it was you know it had to be it was before dime got killed so it was like 2002 maybe or something like that yeah uh and he was already they were already having rumors of a reunion and then after there was already talk uh when vinnie was still alive of ha doing it with zach and so this has been in my mind forever you know yeah. this is something that's been in the works a lot longer than people think and and to, to bring in charlie would be to, like to bring in a, a good brother of Vinny's. Why not? You know, and, sure. and staff sure. and time are real good friends. So I, I have thought this should have been something that happened years ago. You know, yeah, it should be, it's a must. You know, Phillips is a, a really good place. As a guitar player yourself, uh, uh, you know, I hate to ask the dreaded influence question because I'm sure it, it, you know, it's out there and you've talked about it before, but so I'll word it differently. Who are some guitar players that when they play, you know, you will just always stop and, and, and like, they will have your attention. Just guys that you just think are great players. Historically. Yeah. Like all the way through history. Well, my I mean, favorite. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Like who are a couple that just really blow you away who like oh, you'll stop all the time and just listen to them play. Well, of course, Eddie Van Halen, I grew up on, but yeah, my favorite guitar player of all time is Alan Collins. By okay, for me, I mean, it's just my personal favorite, right? My, right, think about it, you know. Um, right now, Tim Henson, for sure, yeah, probably the, yep. maybe the greatest guitar player in history. If, if you look at overall hooks and the ability to play some crazy, funky 
magical shit and make that be the lead instrument of a band i mean i think that right. surpasses a lot of people in my opinion but history it has not been you know it's not just about technique and all that stuff it's also also about the feeling of what's happening in in the time that it happens like leonard skinner you know in in alan collins playing the outro solo people think that's like two different dudes playing it's not right. it's one dude right. double it's amazing also. yeah alan collins on the outro solo and so and when i hear him play leads and you know ed king too was great from there uh and of course there's a well, of course jimmy page i mean jesus how many times can we listen to the outro solo of stairway to heaven yeah forever there's no I know. I know. there's no wrong answer there yeah <laughs> so beautiful i know I mean, what you know and then he also you know and how sloppy is jimmy can get pretty sloppy too you know like yeah yeah black dog or whatever the hell that song is you know he goes in his little solo is all fucked up right but it's got a vibe to it uh and then there you know listen to some of the simplicity of of heart you know and those guitar players never yeah. got any kind of never got yeah. any light and you go listen to the listen to magic man how badass some of that stuff yeah. is you know that yeah. goes all the way through the 70s man that's where all the great guitar work was being done the tasty guitar work um and i'm missing people i mean like and then you get into the modern metal world of course i love all those all those guys you know dime and zach yeah kurt all these different people that are great guitar players i just can't think of the rest of them you know? now as somebody now as somebody with children of his own uh are are any of your uh, kids uh uh at all gravitating towards a career in the music industry not now not yet um, no you anticipate no. any of them you anticipate any of them could be headed that way though have they shown an inclination or an, an interest well, they're, yeah they're super talented uh, if, yeah. if they want to be you know but i don't want to push it on anybody to, right right you know. right my parents now, didn't push it on me you know it's just something different different ages different decades and in, in genres right or, uh different lifestyles you know yeah so i'm not you know i think it's wrong to force if you know it's like you know you got to go to music class or whatever right, you know, they, right. kids have to get into it themselves and if they do great you know but well i, um, I of course feel a certain pressure being the offspring of diamond david lee roth you know to be an, yeah. an, 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 an enigmatic front man uh, myself but just can't seem to get my own glam sleaze band love sword off the ground i don't know what i'm doing wrong dave i just don't know what i'm doing i've got the name i you know i've got the mm -hmm. stage name uh of course rex with three x's i think nothing gets more 80s you know the more x's you put in your name um so but if love sword can get off the ground and i can find the right players can i get a dave fortman uh to produce it maybe pro bono yeah <laughs> or dave doesn't work pro bono no <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that yeah i'm not sure <laughs> but, so, well, listen, I, the man. Name, just with the name alone i might i don't know love sword oh name. okay so you like the love sword name okay I like that. Name. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, I, listen, man, it's been a blast talking to you, man. I really appreciate you being so generous man. with your time, man. Uh, Thank um, you. We'll, you know, we'll stay in touch. Hopefully, we can do it again sometime. It's just been great picking your brain and talking music with you, man. And uh, yeah, I'm thanks. glad we finally got a chance to do this after, you know, we had a couple times where we missed each other. Real life happens. and But everything yeah. is okay. Everything is okay with the family and everything. Oh, uh, yeah, we're good, man. Yeah. Good. Good, 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 good. It was really nice talking to you, man. And uh, too, again, I, yeah. I appreciate it, man. And uh, uh, I encourage my audience to go check out uh, all that new Ugly Kid Joe stuff and all that old Ugly Kid Joe stuff and anything that all Dave that Fortman stuff. has put his goddamn name on because he's produced everybody. <laughs> right, dude. I you appreciate really? it, man. Thank Thanks, you, Mr. Man. Fortman. I appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your day, buddy. Thank you. All right, brother. Talk soon. All right, talk Bye. to you later. Bye-bye. There you have it, folks. The legendary Dave Fortman. You know him. You love him. He's got a little bit less hair than he had back in the day, but that guy is shredder extraordinaire for a little band called Ugly Kid Joe. And if you don't know who they are, you should be beaten with a very large stick and then forced to go back and find their music and listen to it. He's also produced. Oh, geez. I, I, I know I'm going to leave bands out here, man, but um, Jesus, his name has been attached to, as I mentioned, Super Joint Ritual, Crowbar, Soylent Green, Slipknot, Godsmack, Evanescence, Mudvayne, American Head Charge. Uh, as you heard, maybe Love Sword, you know, if he wants to, uh, you know, add a huge, huge name to his resume. <laughs> but uh, do go check out anything that he has done and put his name on. 
uh, great guitar player, great producer. I implore everyone to go out and support him and support everything that he does. Uh, you know, as always, I know my audience will go out there and do it. Hope you guys enjoyed that episode of Pod Scum. And remember to take it easy and keep it sleazy.